I'm joined here by uh, Frank uh, Dunsmuir, who heads up this stuff for Fujitsu, by Tony Smith, who's been 40 years, I think, in the border force, and by our commission's mainframe computer, of course, <laughs> Shankar, who's sitting over there on my left. Uh, we're going to discuss the border itself, the seamlessness of it, just how smooth can it be? How much technology that we've been discussing all day is actually here at the moment, and how much more remains to be developed? And is there sufficient collaboration between the various government departments that is needed? And indeed, is there work that can be put in hand now with the two countries most affected, Ireland and uh, France? So I'm going to ask uh, Frank to kick off, if he, w if he would, followed then by Tony and Shankar, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. Frank Dunsmuir. Just to level set where we are with the, the conversations, to talk a little bit about what does a digital border mean. Uh, we've heard a lot in the press, we've heard a lot about how technology will provide the answer for the Brexit challenges, etc. Uh, and first of all, in the report, you talk... Two seconds, you've you switched your mic. Your mic. Switched off. I hope, you, I hope you caught some of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, in the report, we do, we do position... <laughs> 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 I Good stop. Thought, I should have thought of that one, Stephen. On, thank friend. you. Off you go. So, um, so we position technology behind the policy side. So, first of all, we're thinking of policy, and then how does technology enable that? But the what does digital borders mean? And it's very much a theme that's that's global. And uh, if you look at most regions around the world, they're thinking about how they can use technology at the border to make it as seamless an experience as possible, whether that's for goods or for people. Um, and there are many examples of that, but the basic concept is one of, uh, do I know what's arriving at the border so I can think about it before it gets there? Do I know what it is when it's arrived, you know, in either goods or people, and do I know where it's going? Am I happy with all of that? And the more information I've got as a border management and border control on those criteria, the better the, the process is going to be for both managing the border and also for the people that are moving goods across the border uh, or if you're on holiday and you're travelling across the border yourself. So the digital border is one of a concept of providing that information about not just the, um, let's talk about goods, the, um, the, the, the vehicle, but what's inside the vehicle. We heard about Internet of Things, but we also want to know what customs information are associated with those goods and that they have been properly declared, properly uh, licensed, and that they are appropriate for entry into that country, etc needs to be tied in with a trusted trader regime as well so that we, we, we've got some trust with the people that are moving those goods. So that by the time it's arrived at the border, the idea is it could seamlessly move through with the minimum of checks or no checks. Uh, and there are many examples of that in place today. So if you look at, um, I was in uh, Canada recently and they're piloting um, seamless borders with trucks where they're pre-registered and, and they will... Um, drive through the border. The only reason they stop is for driver recognition, because you still have to have passports. But they're preparing for autonomous vehicles. And there'll be a day when those vehicles will, will move through, through the border. And there are indeed in, in um, Lars's home country or next door, they, they are working on uh, exactly that process with, in the trial at the moment, where vehicles are actually driving through the border with, with no checks, provided they're pre-registered. So the concept is there. And it's one that we need to think about how that would apply here, both for the, the border in Northern Ireland, but also, let's not forget about Dover as well, and, and Holyhead and Calais, which are routes into uh, trade routes for, for the island of Ireland and, and, uh, and GB as well. So we do need some sort of seamless experience for those, those borders as well. Perhaps Tony can add to it. Well, l let me just, <laughs> can I just pick you up on a couple of points, and then we'll go over to uh, uh, Tony before we open it up. Um, can I just speak, you've used the phrase at the border. Mm -hmm. um, in, on, the, on the island of Ireland, where I was recently, mm. they don't want a border yes. at all. That's a great point. Yeah. So I just want to be clear, I mean, what are the challenges that the newer technology absolutely mm. has to address? Yeah, it's, it's a great point, because the, the, um, the real focus of uh, the seamless border and digital border is one of moving the checks away from the border. So I mentioned at the beginning that it, it's about knowing what's coming to the border. At the moment, if, if you're a, a border force operator in, in Dover or Calais, you only know the truck's coming when it's arrived, and, and you know what's on it when they've given you the customs document. 
So let's move that check to uh, uh, in advance, just like you do when you're um, uh, traveling by airplane. You, you provide advance passenger information, you, you mm -hmm. register. We know fully well who's on the plane and who's arriving before they arrive. Mm -hmm. So it's pre-notification, do the checks before they arrive at the border. And then seamless experience is one of we've already risk assessed and they can move through the yeah, border. So, so it's, it's more about understanding in the marketplace. Sure. Frank, just so that we're clear, though, somebody who doesn't do that, I'm not suggesting there's ever been any smuggling on the Republic of Ireland, um, but somebody who doesn't do that, how are they picked up by your technology? Um, yes, a really good question. If they, if they choose not to register and just drive through the border. Yeah. So that, that, that's where the importance is about uh, adoption of trusted trader regimes. So we know, we know which organisations predominantly are, are trading, which are um, intend to import and export by registering those people, and they have to register for import and export anyway. So it is by having that information up front about who's trading, what they are trading with, that we know in terms of what's moving in the marketplace, we yeah. know where the products are. Therefore, we, we've got a better capability of finding the products that aren't uh, being registered, etc. So for example, we recently in the EU um, announced uh, barcode uh, process a barcode mechanism on, on cigarette packets so you can track all cigarettes that are sold in the EU. So that traceability is there now, right down to the consumer level. So the better we get at tracing products in the marketplace, the better we are at finding those oh, products that are more legitimate or, or aren't legitimate. So having a proper handle on all the legitimate trade, mm -hmm. you're eliminating That's right. almost everything yeah. else down to what might be smart. Moving well, the haystack. I'm sure there'll be questions on all that, but let's go yeah. over to uh, Tony first. Tony Smith. Okay, so well, thank you, uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming along today, and uh, and thanks to Shanka for having me on the panel. I, I, I found it, even though I, I, I describe myself as a borders guy, um, because I have been actually in the borders business for a very very long time indeed, uh, 40 years in the Home Office and five years uh, since I retired from the Home Office, actually um, travelling around the world to events like this, talking about borders and 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 trans. It, it, it essentially border transformation programs. I, I did want to say I'm not a customs guy because actually a borders guy and a customs guy are not the same thing and it, 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 it's very easy to confuse that I think here because clearly a lot of the problems that we're discussing in the context of the Irish border are related to traditional areas of customs uh, checks, customs jurisdiction and agriculture, DEFRA checks and not so much to, to what I would define as the border but um, I, you know, we did a, a survey when I was still in government, um, something called One Government at the Border, and you probably know there's 26 different departments and agencies in the UK that have an interest in the border. And I, I was ahead of the border force, so I, I had to listen to 26 different view, points of view on what we ought to be doing at our border with my <laughs> 8,000 people and my £600 million budget. And I couldn't do everything, and so I had to be selective, and in fact, up until now, customs has not been the top priority at the UK border, frankly. It has been about uh, border security primarily um, and secure movement of people and, uh, and targeting goods for harmful purposes. But these regulatory issues that Hans talks about um, and, and, and uh, that Lars talks about have not really been a top priority for the UK border force before now. Now, HMRC has come back to the force. I just wanted to make that point. And, and, and the other point was something, Nikki, you said at the last um, commission, was the common travel area. Mm. And did we need to, to, to worry about the common travel area or not? And I see the, the, the guys from Queen's University Belfast at the back there, because I came over to Bel Belfast, and thank you, Katie, for having me, and that's where I met Shankar. Mm -hmm. And, and I, my, my role there was to talk about the common travel area, actually. And, and, and there was a question about whether or not you actually needed me there, because it was all going to be Shankar um, doing his wonderful stuff. But, 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 but in the event, what, what, what's happened is that, 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 that we have found that we can't, it, we ought not to ignore the common travel area and we ought not to ignore it for a couple of reasons. I think the primary reason, I don't think everybody fully understands what it is. And not just maybe mm. people in this room, maybe you all do and I do you a disservice, <laughs> but certainly mm. some people in, down on the Irish border don't because we were in uh, Newry uh, last, just last weekend mm -hmm. in, in, in Derry, London Derry, and a lot of people were talking about having to show their passports when the UK leaves the EU uh, in order to go to the shops, in order to perform their business. And, and, and so I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us including all of the, the comms guys, the media guys here, to, to, to make this clear that actually there won't be 
a need for passport checks on the Irish border. And I say that with some confidence, because when I was a young officer back in the 70s at Heathrow, I was posted to Terminal 1, which was European flights, and we had a separate channel for flights coming from the common travel area, and they bypassed us, and we dropped straight into the customs hall. We did not examine, and we still don't. It stood the test of time, and there's a little-known piece of legislation called, called the Control of Entry Through Ireland Order of 1972, which many of the researchers here won't find on Google because there wasn't any Wikipedia in those days, but I happened to, <laughs> I happened to implement that and spent a good deal of time over in Ireland speaking to my counterparts there about how actually this would work. And what we have, ladies and gentlemen, is a perimeter strategy uh, for people. Uh, which is very similar, which you may understand better, to the Schengen Agreement that exists in the European Union. In that, anybody, and you probably do know this, entering the Schengen zone of the European Union will be checked at the first point of entry by a border officer uh, for your credentials. But once you're in, you can keep moving around that zone and you won't be checked again. That is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, in the, in the common travel area, or should happen in the common travel area. I can't say in practice it always does, because there are other checks that may take place in certain specified circumstances for certain reasons that I haven't got time to go into. But I do think we need to bank um, the common travel area. I do think we need to be very cognizant of it, in that it is a, a framework that is our own uh, perimeter strategy that has existed well before the European Union <laughs> uh, was even thought of, let alone the Schengen, and it has stood the test of time, and I think we need to recognise the fact that if we can then say, well, all right, then people movements are not an issue, can we please be agreed on that <laughs> and park that, and then we can get into some of the more difficult stuff that, that Shanker's talking about. I, 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 I did want to also um, just touch on your point, Michael, about the, um, uh, the technology, because... I've read a, a lot of stuff that's been written by a lot, a lot of people in, in this room have written a lot of stuff about border technology. I, I am chairman of something called the International Border Management and Technologies Association, and we were, some of us were, at, I, I co-chair the International Summit on Borders with, with my good friend Judge Rod Bonner, who's a former commissioner of CBP. And, and, and I think someone said earlier that, 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 that there is a, you know, that, that technology is all we talk about. It's not true. That's not all we talk about, but th there is no doubt, ladies and gentlemen, there is a paradigm shift going on in border control across the world driven by technology. There is no doubt in my mind that that is happening anyway. If we just leave Ireland out of the equation for a moment, you know, when I was on the border, everything was done by paper. Everything's an E now. I mean, there's a, an E passport, an E uh, gate, uh, an E manifest, um, an E customs... Saved by the bell. And as small as you get. Here we go. You've, you've even got e fire alarm tests. <laughs> um, so, so I mean, it, it, it is largely now uh, a different kind of a border, and customs border posts are shutting down across the world. Checks are being done in the way that, that Frank uh, described. We get data. It's about data. We get the data ahead of time on people and goods. We analyse that data. We decide when and where to intervene. And that intervention may not necessarily be, Michael, at the physical border. It may well take place well before the goods or the person arrives at your physical border, or it may well take place afterwards. And so I think we do need to be cognizant of the fact that borders are changing anyway, Globally, I'm not saying that's a perfect solution for this mm. complex set of issues, but I think we need to be aware of it. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much. Just two questions, if I may, on that. Uh, I think you're telling us that um, our dependence on the Irish Republic, on people arriving in the Irish Republic, who uh, we, of, would be of interest to us inside the United Kingdom, that will not be affected by Brexit, as far as you see no reason why there should be additional passport checks on the island of Ireland. Is that the position? Yes, there's no reason for any additional checking. Well, what I mean, what what these arrangements are underpinned by, and I, know I keep going back to Queens, but somebody asked, somebody told me <laughs> at Queens that the Common Traveller Agreement was written on the back of a fag packet. Um, I mean, I'm not sure it was written on the back of a fag packet, but it's not underpinned by the same legislative framework that exists in the Schengen Acquis. And so we do need um, a, 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 an agreement, a, a very firm commitment to that agreement right. by all parties, including the UK uh, government, the Irish government and the EU, 
about that particular question. Because yes, in principle, you're right. They check people uh, entering the Republic uh, of Ireland who are coming onto the UK, and we do it for them, and we have an arrangement. But, but that has to be underpinned by a really strong operational structure. And, and one thing that's worried me a bit about this exercise, and we haven't seen evidence of a significant amount of engagement between the operational agencies that are going to have to implement this. We've seen a lot about discussions elsewhere, and I'd really like to see that. Well, that takes me actually straight on to my second question, was when you spoke about the collaboration between the 26 different departments who've got an interest in the border, it is three years since the referendum. I mean, how much of that collaboration now is taking place? How much more mm. needs to take place? I mean, are there particular issues there with one department or another? Well, there has been a good deal of work done by the Border Delivery Group in HMRC, um, and I think they have tried valiantly to bring together all of those different uh, communities into one right. space to talk about the UK border. But what I would like to see is, is something that I used to do when I was in charge of the Border Force, is to invest in the international dimension of talking to my neighbours, because good fences make good neighbours. And I spent a good deal of time on the Pas de Calais, speaking to the French gendarmerie, Le Paf, and also in Ireland, speaking to my counterparts there about how, it, what are the problems, what are we seeing? What are the trends that we want to work together to tackle smuggling, human trafficking, international organisers? We've got a huge amount of common ground to work with. And that demands, in my experience, collaboration. It's a word that's been mentioned a few times here, but I do think we need to have more bandwidth to collaborate operationally between our neighbours on dealing with common challenges. Okay. And then, and only then, can we really solve the problem. Good, thank you. Right, now, finally, Shankar. Oh, thank you. Um, and it's, I, I would say it's been great to have Tony on the technical panel because of his um, operational experience. So it's not just the common travel area and, and other things, but just generally, how do we actually operationalise these um, recommendations? Um, so I would encourage you all to read the, the operational chapter uh, carefully. Um, I just, I'll just make three points, really. Um, one is, I think um, there was a discussion earlier on about how long it takes to do things. And I think we, we, ha we have a forcing event here. Um, and, and, and hopefully, um, necessity uh, may be the mother of invention with respect to things like single window and be better collaboration between um, agencies. It can be done quickly. It, it really is just a question of political will. Um, and if, if ever we had a, an occasion to come together, this is, this is the occasion. Um, so I, 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 I would want to make that point. I think that point also is true of the private sector and private sector collaboration, because none of these solutions and, and ideas are only in the government. There, there are about 10 things you have to do, about seven of which have to be done by the private sector. So um, you, you need to have private sector collaboration um, at a pretty early, uh, early stage. Uh, and there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem, which is if the government is unable to collaborate, as Tony has described, then it's very hard for the private sector to engage with anything. So I think one of the central recommendations coming out of the operational aspects of the report is, is the need for, um, if you think about the trade, um, Ireland across the UK land bridge, <coughs> Dover Calais into the European Union, what does that mean? It's basically Irish customs authorities, UK customs authorities, French customs authorities, that, that, that trio of, 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 of collaboration needs, well, it needs to have started two and a half years ago, um, but, you know, we are where we are. Um, it, it certainly needs to start tomorrow. Um, and I think it would be fair to say, and I don't think it's a particularly controversial point, that um, there has not been a high degree of collaboration. In fact, in some respects, there has been less cooperation and collaboration than there usually is. Um, and that's partly because of the, um, you know, some, some uh, have taken the view that we don't want to discuss alternative arrangements because um, if we discuss them, we might make them real, and we don't want to make them real for various reasons. So um, that has to change. If we're going to get a solution here, that kind of uh, a discussion has to change. I would also make one point in terms of customs checks, and, and we do this throughout the report. I mentioned this earlier on. It's, it's a really important point. Um, we need to differentiate between what are customs registration procedures and formalities, which are often uh, electronic submissions and those sorts of things, with actual physical checks, which are sparing 
and intelligence-led. And one aspect um, of the recommendations in terms of physical checks that are necessary, um, uh, which, again, will be very comparatively rare, um, is the process by which you would get the community's consent for some of these things. So, first of all, we laid out this morning how you would use existing WTO flexibilities like the frontier traffic exemption and so forth to uh, negate, and the national security exemption and so on, to negate the need for, um, uh, for those sorts of processes and checks in a very defined area. Um, but even outside of the defined area, um, you still want to have collaboration and discussion between customs, b border agents and so forth about whether it makes sense to do this particular thing and what is the risk associated with with doing this thing, and do, do we really have the community's consent for, um, for, for <coughs> these sorts of uh, processes? Um, and that is something, as Tony will tell you, I mean, that's, that's something that um, every single time there is a check that needs to be done is a process that needs to be, uh, that needs to be gone through. And then in terms of, the, I'll, I'll finish with this, in terms of the, um, how do we protect the single market and the customs union of the European Union in Ireland, what they will want to see is a greater uh, amount of, well, I suppose three things. They'll want to see, um, I think, they'll want to see um, uh, reliance on uh, laws on non-conforming non products. Uh, again, I don't think that's particularly controversial in, uh, in Ireland. Um, market surveillance, using that as the technical customs term, not, the, um, uh, not surveillance as in, as in uh, you know, looking out over what people are doing. But market surveillance in the technical sense uh, relying on private sector for, for that, but increasing market surveillance in Ireland um, so that you can be uh, sure that products that are in uh, Ireland are, are actually conforming with European legislation. Um, and then the very final thing, single window was discussed several times uh, during the day. Um, again, it's a turf issue. It really is. It is just a question of um, uh, agencies... Uh, deciding that this is critical, that this is a mission critical um, thing and it needs to be done. And if we ever had a moment where we need to do it, this is, this is the moment. So if, if the UK can't come up with a single window in this, in this context, I don't think we'll ever come up with it. So, um, so I think we need to use that forcing event to actually solve some of these um, turf uh, issues. Okay, Shankar, thank you very much.